Okay, so today is October 17th, 2015. My name is Katherine Bynum. I am a, a graduate student at Texas Christian University, and I'm working here for the Latino Americans 500 Years of History with the City of Fort Worth. So today I'm speaking with uh, uh, Patricia Zapata. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time and your participation in the project. So, okay, thank you. Um, so let me go ahead and just get started by asking uh, when and where you were born. I was born here in Fort Worth, Texas, mm -hmm. Harris Hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what year? 1953. Okay. And uh, who? Um, I'm sorry. So, 55. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> Um, can you describe, you know, the neighborhood that you went to, uh, that you grew up in, the schools that you went to school to? Mm -hmm. so. I grew up in the north side of Fort Worth. Okay. Um, we were very active, you know, with everything going on in the north side. Uh, I went to school across the street from the home we were raised in at All Saints Catholic School. Uh, so we were real close to uh, the church there, the Catholic church there, and the nuns lived on the same street. and on both sides of the street and uh, so I was pretty much you know just raised in a Catholic school and then uh, for high school I went to Northside High School graduated from Northside and uh, just you know did the normal things people do played basketball mm -hmm. uh, you know um, just played baseball um, just the normal things people. What did Northside look like when you were growing up? Northside? Mm -hmm. um, the Northside, the part that I knew, of course, because I was young, um, was, I always thought it was a good place to grow up. I, I didn't notice any differences or anything. You know, uh, our parks weren't as, our park wasn't as nice as uh, like Forest Park and stuff, you know, but uh, you know, Dad made sure that he'd take us everywhere. So mm -hmm. we, we actually, I consider us a fortunate fa family. Um, Dad was middle class, and we were able to do all the things that uh, other people were allowed. You know, were able to do. And yet, I knew, you know, a lot of friends that weren't able to mm -hmm. do the stuff we did. Like we went to all the circuses and stuff. But Dad was, um, he worked for Bell Helicopter. So he had a lot of access to uh, certain events, mm -hmm. you know, that they put on or that they had a night there or something. So we were always able to get tickets to things. Mm -hmm. And we'd take friends, sometimes people that wanted to go and do stuff. But and your dad is, you know, uh, Louis Zapata. Um, and then who is, what about your, what about your mother? What was her name? My mom, Mary mm -hmm. Zapata. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a teacher at J.P. Elder. Mm -hmm. Uh, gosh, I don't know, I want to say 30 years maybe mm -hmm. she taught there and uh, she taught the ESL classes, English Second Language. Mm -hmm. um, she was, she started out as uh, like an assistant there and, uh, you know, eventually was really just teaching the classes there with all the little kids. Do you and know how your parents met? Yes. Uh, my dad was very young when they got married. <laughs> um, he uh, was 17 when he got married. He had already graduated high school when he was 16. Uh, and they went to, uh, there used to be um, Mexican dances that were held like every Saturday, you know, with more of the big band Mexican music back then. And they were held either like at the Northside Coliseum or at Casino Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, casino used to have a like a dance hall there on the beach and so the dances were held at one or the other and he met her one night at uh, the Northside Coliseum. So he grew up here in Fort Worth? He grew up in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. He was born near downtown Fort Worth. Oh, wow. um, he was born at 500 Mills mm -hmm. which is um, it's just you know where the bridge crosses the Trinity River well down below there used to the right there used to be homes all through there and then at one point they finally people sold their their homes there it was called la corte which which i guess you know is mm. the courthouse and um they ended up selling their homes and actually um 
uh, the Leonard brothers built a subway. I don't know if, I'm sure y'all don't remember the subway <laughs> system. There was a subway that would take you from right there. People would park their cars there and it took you into what's called Leonard's, which is the Dillard's bought them out. Right. And uh, at the Tandy Center, what's known as the Tandy Center now, back then it would just take you into the basement of Leonard's downtown. From there you could go out and shop downtown and not have to worry about parking. Mm -hmm. But he was born right down there yeah. at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we still have the bed. <laughs> so. And what about your mother? Where was her family from? She's from Pittsburgh, Oklahoma. Mm. Um, she was uh, raised quite differently than my father. Uh, she came from a sharecropper family, and her, as well as um, her father was a miner. Uh, he mined mm -hmm. and and then they would do sharecropping yes yeah. mm -hmm. and then they would uh, do sharecropping and stuff all the kids mm -hmm. had to participate and uh, they did cotton mm -hmm. and um, she was raised very poorly mm -hmm. she didn't have much so when it was kind of time to venture out uh, mom and her sister felt that Fort Worth would be a good place to come and they knew some some people here or a couple of ladies here and they came to Fort Worth to look for jobs. How old was she? Uh, yeah, let's see, she was 21 when dad married her, so she must have been 20. Okay. And uh, when she moved uh, down with her sister, or yeah, down with her sister, <laughs> so, um, but she, um, they met, they fell in love, got married very quickly, and uh, then they started a family. Mm -hmm. So, And how many children are in the family? Um, Mom and Dad only had three children. Mm -hmm. My sister, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Helen, and uh, myself, mm -hmm. and then my brother, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years my junior. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so you're the middle? I'm the middle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, my sister, she just passed away a few months ago, so and uh, thank you, and uh, like I said, my brother, well, the favorite, <laughs> you know, of course, at this point, dad had had, you know, one girl, then another girl, <laughs> and then there was that 10-year gap, and you know, they'd kind of thought, well, guess no more kids, and then Lewis came. Mm, okay. He never thinks he's the fair one, but he is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's a small family, especially for Hispanics, because mm. usually there's a lot. I, my, uh, my mom had um, 10 brothers and sisters total, so that's a lot. What about your dad? How many siblings? My dad, uh, there were five born, but one that passed away before dad was even born. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he ended up, uh, there was my dad and his brother, Jesse. Then he had two sisters, uh, Carmen and uh, Connie. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's really a small family considering mm -hmm. most Hispanics do have mm -hmm. eight or more children, seems like. So yeah, we were a pretty small family. So your parents get married, um, mm -hmm. your dad is 17 when he's married, mm -hmm. and your mother's 21, uh -huh. is that right? And then you said he worked for Bell Helicopter? Yes, um, he did. Do you know that story? Do you know how he decided to go to work for them? Or? Yes, um, you know, he was, um, he was a real bright child and adult. Uh, we never got to forget that, so, <laughs> but uh, he, um, when he went to his, he was raised by his mom alone because his dad died when he was seven. Mm -hmm. So my grandma was a real strong woman, very ambitious as well. Um, they, they had good values, good work ethics. And um, so that's what he saw always, mm -hmm. you know, between his dad, you know, who came up from Del Rio which is a little town. Uh, I mean, not a little town, but back then it, mm -hmm, it wasn't yeah. much. And um, his dad came up, he opened uh, a, one grocery store, then a second grocery store, 
Um, he had two restaurants. Uh, and, and for somebody, especially in the Hispanic world back then, uh, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, he had homes. And then he passed away, though, like I said, when my father was seven. And so dad was raised by my grandma. Well, she wanted to make sure, he, because there was a, a gap between him and his sisters, um, she wanted to make sure that he grew up knowing values and stuff. So she put him at San Jose, uh, which is now just a, a hall, you know, that the church owns. And uh, so he went there his first or third grade, and but they double promoted him twice while he was there. But he used to take the bus from downtown to school and he was only six. So, but things were different then too. But uh, grandma worried about him. So then she pulled him once he graduated, oh, I mean, once he was done with third grade, she moved him uh, to the John Peter Smith. They used to have an ele uh, John Peter Smith Elementary School. And so he went there, but then they didn't recognize any of his school stuff from San Jose. So he had to start the first grade over at 10. Or I'm sorry, he was eight when he started the first grade over. And then, but at John Peter Smith, they realized, oh, he is smart. Mm -hmm. So they double promoted him three years in a row. So he went from first grade to third grade, from third grade to fifth grade, fifth grade to seventh. And then she, she put him at what's called St. Ignatius uh, School for Boys. And that's really St. Patrick's, if you know where the cathedral is. Mm -hmm. Right next door, there was a school. And that's uh, St. It was St. Ignatius for Boys. And uh, so he went there until high school. And in high school, he went to Trimble Tech. Okay. Trimble Tech, he um, learned printing. And being ambitious, he uh, started working for different printing companies. And then um, him and mom, you know, were married. And he built a, a big workshop in the back of our home and started subcontracting out to General Dynamics, Bell Helicopter. And so he did that on the side, mm -hmm. did all of that type of work. Bell Helicopter just liked his work ethics and everything, so they hired him on permanently. And then just quickly he moved up the ladder mm -hmm. there. He went to school at uh, what was Arlington State back then, which is University of Texas in Arlington okay. now. Yeah. He went to school there, uh, night school, and then he went to TCU for two years. And at Bell Helicopter, um, he quickly got moved up to what's called logistics administrator. And he was in charge of uh, all of the uh, requisitions and stuff that came. Back then you had the Vietnam War going on. And uh, so of course, helicopters down all the time and stuff. So he was in charge of all the military uh, acquisitions and stuff and um, that had to get out their parts that they needed to repair the stuff so that they continue on. And uh, he had a real important role at Bell and, you know, he never took any of his work lightly. Mm -hmm. And But that's how he ended up getting to Bell, I mean, which was really, you know, one of the better paying jobs in town, that and General Dynamics mm -hmm. were the two top paying jobs in town. So, but uh, we remained in the same house. There, <laughs> up until this year. Uh, I mean, we found that we were there forever. Right. How long did he work at Bell? He worked um, there 30, 30 years, 30 years, and then he did a retirement. Um, he, he didn't, he did a leave of absence though for a little while when he was on city council. Mm -hmm. Uh, he did a leave of absence because he just felt that he couldn't keep up and um, give his all to the city council when he was working and then he didn't have enough time at night to really review stuff and find out stuff and 
you know, research stuff. So he took a, a short leave of absence, went back to work, and then he re ended up retiring. So do you know what made him decide to run for city council? Yes, he um, he was on assignment for the the government. I'll just leave it like that. It's the like the Department of Defense oh, okay. in in Mexico oh, okay. City. Well, mm -hmm. in those areas, mm -hmm. and um, there were just a few of them that were signed out there, and that was a two year commitment without being able to come back or anything. Um, and um, while he was there, though. Um, Someone here locally, uh, Pat Reese, who was a politician here in town, uh, gave him a call and said, Liz, you know, the, the voters have voted that we, we're going to go into single member districts. Okay. Uh, you guys probably don't remember the way it was before, but it was at large. Mm -hmm. And at large, no, no Hispanic was going to be able to win there. So, um, Do you remember what year that was? Or they decided to go to 1977. 77. It was going to be for the year of 1977 okay. would be mm -hmm. the elections. Right. They decided it, I want to say around 70, between 74 and 75 because uh, somewhere in there around 75. So there had been a lawsuit against the city or? No, it had just been put out. Okay. Uh, someone had brought it up. They put it out for the vote. And it was voted that okay. people wanted single member districts mm -hmm. to represent their district right. and not at large. Right. And uh, so he contacted my dad, and dad said, "Why would I get in politics?" You know, he and he said, "Because you're, a, you know, you're in charge of the UAW, which is union." And he that was a union member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did their negotiations. Okay. Um, he had five major negotiations that uh, he was well known for in the union, mm -hmm. uh, representing Bell Helicopter mm -hmm. and all the workers there. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's he's a good negotiator, mm -hmm. which wasn't easy on us as kids. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't caught us, we couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> if we lied, he'd just continue on, <laughs> let us wrap it real good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> so then we just learned to just tell him. <laughs> we knew when he asked, he knew. So, uh, but yeah, he was a real good negotiator. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, he had a way with people. Yeah. He was just honest, had integrity, you know, that type of person. And Pat Reese just seemed, you know, Louis, you're the man. You, you know, you can do this and you've lived here all your life. And, and anyway, when Dad came back in 77 from his assignment, uh, he chose not to continue on doing the assignment any f further. Um, he, uh, Pat had put his name in the hat. And Dad was like, hey, I don't, you know, you got to have money to do this and so forth and so on. So they started raising money to see if he could really do it. And um, he ended up being in a runoff the first mm. The very first time um, he was in a runoff, there were uh, four Anglos that ran and uh, three Hispanics, mm -hmm. including my father was mm -hmm. one of them. And it was a runoff between him and a man named uh, Wade Banowski. Okay. And um, so that was going to be a tough one still because District 2 back then went up to uh, Oakhurst. I'm not sure if you, if you take Northside Drive straight up into Riverside. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oakhurst or all those homes right up in there. Right. Okay. Back then, there were no Hispanics lived there, mm -hmm. not one. You know, it was, it was an all-white neighborhood, and um, and nothing against that. <laughs> Married to Anglo, <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was an all-white neighborhood. It just, you know, the way it was. Um, so Dad ended up uh, being, you know, having the runoff with Wade. And um, it took a lot of effort. Uh, he had, m most people on their campaigns have paid workers that do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he had one person that he paid, and that was his marketing person, you know, because you have to have somebody that's at the head saying, this is what we need to do, this is where our numbers are. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had one person that did that. Um, they came up with a good marketing strategy because a lot of people didn't know Lewis. So 
they decided to put just the name Sabata on all the city buses. And uh, some of them said, Viva Sabata. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them just said Sabata. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you see something enough, you go, what is, what is that? You know, yeah. and so he got that name recognition with that, which was a very smart marketing done. Uh, but he relied on volunteers. And he had uh, a lot of volunteers, um, not as many as he did in upcoming elections after that, but he had a lot of volunteers. Uh, we all worked the streets, handing out pamphlets and knocking on doors, answering questions they Are might have siblings? about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, well, me and my sister, uh, my uh, friends, just mm -hmm. people, volunteers there. Mm -hmm. Jim Lane was one of them. Um, he was very involved with our campaign. And we literally knocked on doors, door after door after door, went into all the neighborhoods that were pr uh, predominantly black or uh, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, Dad went and, and spoke with uh, different churches um, in the Hispanic community and in the black community mm -hmm. to get their support. Mm -hmm. um, so he was able to um, use his gift of gab, I guess, to be able to show people what he wanted to do for their area. Mm -hmm. And he won the election. So it was the first, he was the first Mexican American to hold office in the city of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And that was in 77. And then he served uh, six two-year terms after that. So he won six more, six times mm -hmm. after that. So he was the longest running as well as the first. The first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, like I said, uh, the, it helped us that he worked at Bell Helicopter mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, we had a lot of, dad was always into electronic devices. Uh, we were lucky because that means we had like the first TV around the block, <laughs> you know, and then the first color TV and then, you know, the stereo system, you know, and then tape players, which you probably don't know, um, you know, but anything new coming out, dad was right on top of it mm -hmm. because he just enjoyed, he liked every new technology. Um, and so we were fortunate because we were like, wow, this is cool, you know, and kids would come over to our house to see our new stuff. <laughs> but uh, we were, he was a good dad, a good person, good yeah. person in general. What sorts of issues did he try to tackle when he was on the city council? Oh, uh, equality, for one. Uh, equality in, in that everybody is, is as important as someone else, mm -hmm. whether you be black, white, Hispanic, uh, Greek, you know, he, he knew all people as mm -hmm. equals. Uh, he never knew anyone as anything different. Mm -hmm. uh, he remembers the years when, um, apparently when he was growing up, where people would look at him like, oh, well, you're a Mexican, mm -hmm. you know. And things things were different. See, I never knew that that part of uh, being a Hispanic. Did he tell you stories mm -hmm. about being discriminated against? Oh yeah. Can you tell me one? Oh yeah. Oh, um, when uh, they would go into um, and they weren't like restaurants. They'd be more like um, places downtown um, that you'd go and and places where you could be seated and mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, a lot of times they wouldn't allow them in. It was similar to the black population, mm -hmm. um, maybe not as discriminated against as the words being on the wall. Right. I mean, because I remember downtown, and I didn't understand it because I was raised thinking everybody was equal. And I remember downtown with my mom one time, and uh, Stripling's department store was downtown, Leonard's, Monig's. Um, and going into the stores and you'd have a colored um, a colored water fountain and a white water fountain mm -hmm. and colored restrooms, white restrooms. And I used to tell mom, 
what color do you have to be to use the colored? You know, I mean, because it was like just foreign to me. And she said, oh, that's, that's for the blacks. And I take a drink, and she was like, no, no, you're supposed to drink out of the white one. And I said, mom, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so, you know, I drink out of whichever. But, you know, she had been raised where it was, you know, you did. Did you ever drink out of the, the, the color? The, oh, color? yeah, all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did go to the white bathrooms. But, <laughs> but that was because the, the black restrooms were down in the basement. Mm -hmm. And they didn't call them black. They called them colored, literally. And um, that was, that was it, it was surprising to me. But then I was raised in a Catholic school, first through eighth grade. And you're only taught love and Christianity and, mm -hmm. you know, the good things in life that you don't treat people any other way than God treated us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what was the makeup of the school? Was, was there diversity in the school? Um, yes, there was diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably, though, I would say 70% Hispanic and uh, about 5% black. Yeah, and then, you know, the rest would be Anglo mm -hmm. then. Yeah, I mean, so we had a mixture, a mixture of people, a mixture of um, incomes probably. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, our family would have been considered more of the higher end of the income, even though we were really, you know, very middle class. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you had a lot of people that put all their their money's away because they wanted their kids to have that good education. And um, we even at the school had uh, people that were in, uh, f from fostering that would go to, uh, had been taken away from their parents and were, or were orphaned mm -hmm. and lived at orphanages. But of course the church, I'm sure, I don't know, but I'm assuming they must have helped them because they got to come to school as well there. So we had a big mixture there. Um, it was surprising that when I went to Northside High School, I, I realized then how sheltered I'd been. Oh, really? Yes, it was, what? Um, I mean, at All Saints, we never left our room. Teachers came to us <laughs> <laughs> when I got to Northside. It was like, whoa. <laughs> So it was different. It was quite different. So people cussed, people smoked. <laughs> I mean, and I was like, what are they doing? You know, right. because I hadn't been raised around that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it was a shocker that yeah, people were that way. Shocker. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so when you talk about your dad wanting equality, do you feel like it was because of based on those exper experiences whenever he was younger that he was discriminated against and not allowed to eat in certain restaurants and... I, I believe so, and I think he, it, it was his up, upbringing. Like I said, he spent time in St. Ignatius School. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was an altar boy to one of the high bishops in, in town now. Mm -hmm. But as a little kid, um, I remember going to church at St. Patrick's one day with him, and that man couldn't rave about him enough. And I said, how hard is it to be an altar boy? He goes, well, an altar boy that you can count on <laughs> to be here when they say. And, da -da -da. So it was like a, and I was like, oh, okay, because I thought, how hard could that be? But I think that, um, yeah, I just, he just felt so strongly uh, about people. Um, when he negotiated contracts, he was chairman of uh, Human Relations Commission. He had been appointed by the city to be, um, well, first to just be in the Human Relations Commission. Mm -hmm. He moved his way up to, to chairman of it. But um, he set aside rules and, uh, and put it into place, affirmative action. Back then, there wasn't affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Are you talking when he was working with Bell Helicopter and, and with the union? Or? Oh, this is, um, it was volunteer stuff at the city, oh, okay. at the okay. actual okay. city. Right. He did work at Bell Helicopter, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that was all union stuff. That was, he put into play a lot of, uh, for the workers okay. and stuff. He was a good negotiator. He probably won debate things when he was in school or something. But, um, 
no, but in, as far as Human Relations Commission, they put into place, he was introduced um, the Affirmative Action Program, which, you know, a lot of people hated it. Some people loved it, right. you know, um, because, and I can see both sides myself, you know, because I either earn it or I don't, you know, and... Uh, uh, but th those were things that helped because uh, some people were overlooked because of their color mm -hmm. when and so affirmative action came in uh, in the I would say in the late 70s um, to to say okay if we have two people equal then let's go ahead and hire the minority if 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 they're equal, mm -hmm. and then they would hire a minority, and then the next time, maybe go ahead and hire right. the non-minority. Right. But that way, you'd start equaling it out instead of everybody being white, being white at City Hall. Right. <laughs> so that uh, that's kind of how all that had gotten started with the city. Dad was. Do you know how he got started with the Human Relations Commission? Someone appointed him. He okay. had to be appointed by the uh, probably the city council or the okay. or. Um, the mayor, someone like that probably is who points him. This was points before him. he ran for city mm -hmm. council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he had been active in Fort Worth political affairs for a while. Yeah, in human relations mm -hmm. and stuff, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's where, as a matter of fact, that's where Pat Reese knew him from, okay. was his work with them. Okay. So. So. Um, what, um, what other types of issues did he try to think of? I mean, you said he was from District 2, mm -hmm. um, which is... From what I understand, predominantly Hispanic? Um, nowadays, no. But uh, back then, he had the largest district mm -hmm. there was in the city of Fort okay. Worth. It was probably three times the size of anybody else's district. Oh, okay. But that's because a lot of people don't realize how much Fort Worth entails. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth entails all the way past Alliance Airport and goes to 171. I mean, mm -hmm. they own a lot of property. Yeah. People don't realize, oh, because I live in, uh, you know, Keller. Oh, I lived okay. in Keller most, and yet really the city of Fort Worth owns it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my family's from Denton, and so whenever I'm driving 35 yeah. to Denton, I, I swear it's I like enter and Fort leave. Fort Worth, and then leave. Yes, times. exactly. So <laughs> the, the city limits. Yes. And, but it's interesting. I think she's trying to catch oh, yeah, her. I hate to interrupt, but I think this is like in a. I don't think it has anyone remembering. Uh oh. Like it, it says one minute, so I don't want to like. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and pause it, and then I've got another memory card.